All right, great. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, sort of a particular area where our group has been working to try to advance um, what Bragg coherent diffraction imaging can do in material science. The motivation here is that uh, fourth generation synchrotrons, such as uh, MAX4, the upgraded ESRF, the upgraded APS, and so on will provide very high flux, um, coherent flux across the energy spectrum. And that includes the high energy part of the, of the X-ray spectrum where I think we're gonna have a, quite a few opportunities to make some progress. So the question I kind of want to ask is what adaptations to the standard Bragg coherent diffraction imaging methodology are needed to fully capitalize, especially on the high energy end of the spectrum, and to broaden um, the envelope of material science that can be addressed with, with the BCDI type and related methods. So sort of, you know, three areas I'd like to highlight that such opportunities exist are in, in material synthesis, where uh, we're sort of growing nano, nanostructured materials or hetero, heterostructures uh, that, have, that have native um, heterogeneities and nanoscale length scales that occur during the synthesis process. Uh, discovery of structure property relationships especially in the context of uh, polycrystals that are being um, under extreme loads and, and temperatures, and also sort of the fundamental physics of phase transformations where domains often play a role at the nano scale. One thing that all of these, these uh, examples have in common is that they require access to relatively, um, relatively difficult to access environments. Material synthesis is often, you know, in a, in a liquid flux or a gas phase environment at high temperatures. Uh, polycrystals, grains inside of polycrystals are, are often buried within half a millimeter of a, of, a, of a metal, for example. Phase transitions occur at, at high temperatures often and uh, again under different uh, surface conditions. So we need relatively high x-ray energies to access this. You know, the, the typical use, in, use of the 9 keV x-ray beam gets you so far, but I think especially in something like this in the middle example, um, we're going to need higher X-ray energies to get uh, way into the interior of some of these materials to interrogate grains. Um, so then the relevant question is, why is BCDI a compelling tool? You know, the quick answer here is that um, Bragg coherent diffraction imaging provides 3D images of nanoscale heterogeneities and defects in materials. I'll give you two examples of, of recent studies from our group uh, where we took advantage of this kind of capability. Uh, one is to study the hydriding phase transformation in palladium nanoparticles, and we found that dislocation formation affects the reversibility of that phase transformation in larger scale nanoparticles. Um, here, what we were doing is utilizing the fact that the phase of a BCDI image uh, is proportional to the lattice displacement um, of, the, of the interior of this particle, and that lattice displacement then encodes uh, dislocations in a, in a very specific way that were easy to fingerprint, and, and then we could discover that, that those dislocations, in fact, were the impediments of the reversibility of this phase transformation. Another example is that when, when we were investigating the uh, ability to anneal silicon carbide particles in order to, to homogenize the strain fields inside. So starting at room temperature, going all the way up to 900 C, we could, we could follow a single particle and watch the strain fields become more um, less less uh, less extreme inside of that particle as a function of annealing time and temperature. And that was motivated by the need to have uh, strain-free nanoparticles, to process strain-free nanoparticles for quantum sensing, um, as silicon carbide is, is one of these scalable materials that, that could be a candidate for mass, uh, mass fabrication of, of quantum nanosensors. So these are two examples where the sort of 9 keV x-rays were able to penetrate either the gas phase uh, environmental chamber or the, the furnace in this case, and, um, and give us you know, meaningful insight into these materials processes. So how does it work? You know, sort of at a high level, we can kind of draw an analogy to the, to the more typical um, reciprocal space picture one gets from a, from a bulk material, from a single crystal material where we sort of have a large crystal and a small coherence length in our x-ray beam. So then the unit cell, the crystal dictates what reciprocal space looks like. There's a specific you know, spacing and composition and symmetry of this unit cell that then is reflected as, as delta functions in reciprocal space. Um, so here we're sensitive to the structure of the average unit cell if we make such a measurement. 
Now, if we change the properties of the of the system a little bit, we shrink the crystal size down to less than so that the facets are all uh, less than fit into a sort of a micron uh, volume, and we increase the coherence length of our X-ray beam. Uh, now we have a sort of a more complete description of the Fourier transform of this of this object. the The lattice hasn't changed; its orientation hasn't changed since our previous example. So the, so the positions of the delta functions in reciprocal space are all still there. The new piece of information is that each of these delta functions is now decorated with a uh, Fourier transform of this, of this object, of the shape function of this object. And the fact that we're visiting this uh, reflection at different, um, different Q vectors means that the internal strain field and the lattice displacement field is encoded also in these fringes in different ways and different positions in reciprocal space. So here we have a sensitivity to unicell distortions that are distributed over the nanoscale and uh, up to sort of a micron. So how do we make a measurement? Uh, we're going to align this crystal to, the, to one of the Bragg reflections, as we mentioned. We're going to use a 2D detector that's going to measure a slice through that, through that green 3D pattern, typically done at 9 keV. And like we were saying, the beam size here should be larger than the crystal size for a BCDI experiment. We've also done quite a bit of work um, with, with, with the case in which the beam is smaller than the crystal, which is the Bragg tachography case. Um, actually, I, I won't be going into that much here, but just to say that those ideas are, are sort of all, all still valid there in that case as well. I think last week Virginie gave a, a, a seminar on that. Um, so anyway, so now we've got a 2D slice cutting through the middle of this pattern, and it looks something like this on a 2D detector. But we need 3D information. So the way we obtain it is to do a rocking curve. We, we change the angle of the sample of the crystal relative to the incident beam by some, some number less than one degree. We go in small intervals and the, and the detector then surveys parallel planes that cut through this 3D volume. And, and we can then assemble a 3D reciprocal space pattern that contains all these fringes. This is known as a rocking curve. If we integrate all of those 2D planes, we get some sort of uh, you know, a typical rocking curve shape like this. Um, and this data then encodes the 3D structural information about the nanocrystal, but, but is, of course, uh, phaseless. So that begs the question, how do we go backwards? Uh, we've got this measurement of sort of a local distribution of fringes in this part of reciprocal space, and we want a picture of a crystal with strain sensitivity. And, you know, the, the answer, of course, is, is we use phase retrieval to inver in invert those intensity pattern fringes um, into a real space picture. So the basic ingredients in a BCDI um, phase retrieval problem are that you know, we wanna design an error metric, which is for some uh, exit field that is from a guest object, we can, we can quantify the degree to which it matches the measured uh, intensity pattern, 3D intensity pattern I. So one of the constraints of our problem, of course, is our measurement. The um, capital I here is the, is the 3D rag peak that we measured. Um, and then a second constraint that we also put in is this support. So it is a, it is a uh, estimation of the volume in which our uh, our nanoparticles should exist. So that's another critical thing here. I'm, I'm sort of going to skip the details just to say that, you know, we have, a, and we, we also have a forward model here. We have, a, for a guest object, we can take a Fourier transform and create a far field, um, far field pattern that would be consistent with that object. So the error metric then, um, with these uh, HIO and ER type methods and, and, and certain other ones we've been working on, uh, we can sort of walk downhill in this aerometric space and sometimes uphill and then sometimes back downhill. The goal, of course, is that at the, at the, at the minimum um, of this, of this aerometric space should be a, a description of the sample that's consistent with our data and that's consistent with the support. And that is how we sort of uh, obtain an, an answer, so to speak, for, um, for the inverse problem of BCDI. And uh, so, you know, there's sort of a whole field here of designing robust, robust reconstruction strategies to enable reliable imaging. Of course, you know, the, the typical trappings are one doesn't want to get stuck in a local minimum. So there's, there's a whole sort of set of literature about how to hope, hopefully avoid that kind of thing. Um, okay, so then a final note here about the strain sensitivity. Where does it actually originate? <laughs> 
Um, so we're at a, a particular Bragg peak. So the BCDI image that we obtained from that Bragg peak provides a nanoscale spatially resolved map of structure of the structure factor of that Bragg peak. So capital F of the HKL that you're at. So that's what you get in the phase. And uh, for different material systems, this can be interpreted in terms of different, different physical processes. Uh, lattice distortion is sort of a very common one. And that, that's uh, highlighted in this example here. We can actually take the, the equation for the capital F structure factor um, and write it out. And we'll notice in the case of, of lattice distortion that we can factorize uh, the, the average unit cell, um, the average unit cell positions uh, and separate that from the deviatory unit cell positions, which uh, are this U, U term here. And, um, and so what that means is that one can basically treat all of the unit cell as being shifted from its, um, from its nominal position. And that's the, that's the way in which these kinds of dislocation um, fields, dislocation dis, uh, displacement fields can be visualized because one then can predict that there should sort of be this spiral of displacement around a dislocation core of a certain uh, type. And, and that's exactly how this phase can um, can then manifest a, a map of dislocations. Um, I'll just note that this, this model is the most common one in the literature, but it's not the only one. We can also, uh, if we have a different idea of the physical processes of the, of the, um, of changes in the, within the atoms of the unit cell, we can adopt those as well to understand how our phase of HK, of FHKL should be interpreted. So for example, Apple going into ferroelectric materials where the ions in, within the unit cell themselves don't necessarily move in concert, then you know different models can be evoked uh, to, to make sense of those of those images. Um, but you know, generally speaking, the one of the most powerful or the most common ways we can use BCDI is in this lattice distortion uh, interpretation model. Um, and, and so now we could notice that the phase going from uh, pi to minus pi in this map then maps to uh, directly is proportional to the um, the the displacement fields uh, spanning from you know sort of tens of, of picometers, and so that displacement sensitivity is one of the very powerful uh, powerful uh, aspects of this method. Okay, so now I'm going to switch a little bit to this uh, to sort of a new area of impact that our group has been uh, pursuing. Uh, I mentioned this earlier on in the talk where uh, bulk materials are of interest, especially because polycrystals going through thermomechanical loading are, are sort of a big, the mechanisms of deformation there are still a big open question in the field of material science. And so this slide is sort of showing that one of the x-ray methods that have been developed that have gained quite a bit of traction in this field are, is that of high energy diffraction microscopy, which comes in two varieties, near field and far field. And these are often done together. And what do you get when you do a near field plus far field high energy diffraction microscopy um, experiment? In this case, we've got a nickel polycrystal. This isn't our group, this is uh, published earlier. But uh, the near field HEDM method provides sort of the information on the space filling, um, the, the edges of the boundaries of all of these grains. The far field high energy diffraction microscopy method then puts essentially a strain value and an orient, uh, uh, a high precision average strain of this grain as well as its orientation. So that's what this coloration is. This is a orientation map. And now with this method, you can sort of see right away that you get, you know, hundreds and thousands of grains uh, that are describing, they're all interconnected and describing how this polycrystal is made up. And one can then access, you know, relatively quickly statistics of these grains, you know. So in this case, uh, one can map the misorientation between grains and then, um, you know, create pole figures and so on. And, and get a sense of which grains are sort of outliers in terms of misorientation, which are, are very typical. And one can then ask the question, you know, which of these grains are more uh, participatory in the deformation process? And this is where BCDI can help because, you know, BCDI is a sort of a slow-ish process where we have to zoom in on a, on, 
on a single handful of grains. We certainly can't survey all these 100,000 grains. But if we know where to look, BCDI can then um, narrow in on one of these grains and tell you a sort of a deeper story of the deformation mechanisms, especially in the context of a, of a far field or a, of a HEDM experiment. That seems you know, to us to be a pretty exciting opportunity to marry these techniques and get sort of more than the sum of the parts here. So yeah, the opportunities here of combined BCDI and HEDM are that we can provide nanoscale imaging of strain in these hard to access crystallites sort of with the benefit of having the the ensemble um, view of all of the grains from the HEDM method. Uh, we could then with BCDI imagine a 3D zoom in capability um, that goes beyond from the few microns resolution of a HEDM measurement into the uh, tens of nanometers resolution of a BCDI experiment and with the added benefit of sensitivity to things like dislocations um, and, uh, and, the, and the strain fields so that build up near grain boundary uh, junctions, for instance, that are at the moment um, not accessible at all with the HEDM methods. So the challenges ahead of us that we're sort of thinking about are how do we actually integrate with an HEDM experiment? Um, that's one, one challenge. Another is that there's a, once we get to the range of energies where HEDM operates, which is sort of the 50 to 100 keV range, how do we deal with the compression of reciprocal space, which is um, sort of a new, uh, a new area uh, or a new thing to worry about when you're designing an H, uh, a BCDI experiment. So I'll sort of make, uh, give you guys a, a bit of a progress update in two areas. First is, um, is, is how we went about demonstrating the use of a far field HEDM measurement in concert with, B, uh, with BCDI at 52 keV. And uh, give you a little bit of a, a new direction where we're trying to uh, design new measurements that get uh, around these compression of reciprocal space issues in order to resolve the fringes needed for these measurements. So what do I mean by compression of reciprocal space? Um, here we've got a simulation example where we've, we, we've made a sort of an, an equivalent 9 keV, a typical BCDI pattern cut through one of these 3D peaks. Uh, the Q range on the side of the detector is spanned by 128 pixels, right? And if, uh, if we go find that Bragg peak, if we change the energy um, and we go find that Bragg peak again, we will notice that uh, at 54 keV, for instance, the Q range spanned uh, by that same equivalent uh, that equivalent Q range is now spanned by only 21 pixels on a side. And this is effectively like a binning operation. We've, we've coarsened the pixels to a degree that all of these, that there's, you know, one and a half fringes or so fit into one pixel and the integrated intensity is, is then reported. So uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but resolving the minima and the maxima of these fringe patterns, as is done on the left here, is, is central to BCDI. You really need that as that's, that's oversampling the pattern is one of the, one of the key criteria to, to creating the conditions in which phase retrieval actually works. So, um, so this minim, the sampling criteria it, it can, be, can be written down and I've got it here. And the minimum sampling is then dictated by the wavelength of the x-rays, the pixel size of the camera, crystal size, and the sample to detector distance. And the inequality we have to worry about here is, is written there, which uh, is, is basically the, the Shannon sampling criteria. Um, and it's got two, in our case, well, we've sort of taken this inequality and, and designed two kinds of experiments around it, you know, these are the two, the sample to detector distance and the pixel uh, size are two parameters we can sort of play around with to see if we can create the conditions where BCDI can work at high energies. And, you know, what do I mean by high energies? We're, we're going to be showing you some results at, at 52 keV where we've been testing typical nanocrystal sizes in the 400 to 500 nanometer range. <laughs> Uh, using using the high energy beamline at sector one, which is the HEDM beamline at APS. So so let's let's perform the first test, which is manipulation of the sample to detector distance. Uh, so again, we're we're going to the APS sector one. We're operating at 52 keV. I'm sort of skipping a lot of the details of how we manipulated the optics to actually get a reasonable coherence length at these energies at a at an unupgraded. APS. 
Uh, this, of course, won't be an issue once the upgrade happens. But for now, it actually took quite a bit of work to get any coherence at that energy. Um, in any case, so we've got our, our properties here. We've got a 52 keV X-ray beam with a lambda of 0.24, uh, a crystal size, which is a, a, a single grain in a polycrystal film, and that's about 400 nanometers. Uh, in this case, we were using one of these ASI detectors with a detector typical pixelation of 55 microns. You know, the thing we got to do is, is basically um, position the detector at the back end of the hutch. So we had a 6.1 meter distance. So we put all that into the inequality. We find that, in fact, we have satisfied just by sort of brute force moving the detector very far away. We've satisfied the sampling condition, uh, as we can see here. Taking a look at one of the slices from this uh, gold nanograin, we, you know, we do notice that it's oversampled. It looks fine. Uh, and that provided us, you know, with a rocking curve and a full reconstruction of this of this thing. So, you know, sort of this was one of the first, you know, landmarks on this voyage was to just see if BZDI works at all at these energies with this sort of uh, setup. And it does. And so the question, the follow up question we can ask is, you know, we are at an HEDM beamline. Uh, so how does it integrate with the capabilities of HEDM? So here we've got you know here we've got a we were, had the ability to t do a far field hedm scan with a different detector bank than the one that's 6.1 meters this one is about one meter away i think um maybe a little bit a little bit closer in any case it's a it's a huge detector that uh that one can then perform 3d uh 360 degree diffraction uh, mapping and and you have broad coverage in reciprocal space with sort of one of these ge kind of detectors that, that captures Bragg peaks in, of many orders as the samples rotated around. So one then provides with far field HEDM methods, one can provide sort of a very zoomed out view of reciprocal space where all of the Bragg peaks of all of the grains in the beam are measured. And here we, we, we got about 100,000 peaks and the indexing software uh, boiled all that down to about 7,000 grains that are in the beam. And now we've got a list of grains. We've got a list of their Bragg peaks. And, uh, and so the, one of the most sort of basic tests that we could do um, was to take our peak of interest and find its Friedel pair across all of reciprocal space here. Uh, the, the, the central symmetric position in, in the big reciprocal space picture gives us the negative one, negative one, negative one peak. And uh, indeed, when we measure it, we'll see that those two patterns have a central symmetry to them. Um, and measuring the rocking, full rocking curves of both of those peaks then allows us to do two reconstructions that are independent. And they indeed show, in terms of the strain, uh, the derivative of the, of the displacement, they show the same shape and the same strain field. And so this was sort of a very zeroth order test to see if, you know, does the far field method allow you to jump from two equivalent, you know, easily jump from two equivalent peaks of this of this particular grain that's embedded inside of a polycrystal. Indeed, it does. Uh, so this is all written up in a recently published uh, Fizzer of Applied that we that our group put out. And what this does is it sort of opens the door to multi Bragg peak measurements of targeted grains. And you know what I mean really by multi Bragg peak is is a more interesting multi Bragg peak experiment. Here we did a multi Bragg peak experiment that basically encoded the same exact information in two different places. A, a much more interesting experiment that we've already sort of, we have preliminary data on, but we haven't yet uh, analyzed, is to, is to find the family of uh, the, the non-common 111 peaks of this grain. And we can even reach out to the 200, 220, and 311 um, vectors to make much more comprehensive views of the strain field of this, of this particular grain. And again, we have Q ranges here that are, that are basically not accessible at the 9 keV range. And that leads us to enhance strain sensitivity potentially. Um, and, and so, yeah, so there's been, you know, quite a few papers in the literature now that are discussing how one uses many Bragg peaks at once to get the vector field. And this is sort of a, a, another way to attack that problem, having the, the, the big view of reciprocal space at your, at your fingertips. So, all right, so then I'm gonna sort of switch gears here and ask the second question, 
Um, the other bit of that inequality that we can manipulate is that of pixel size. And so just to remind you, we're going to be stuck with a pattern. If we don't have a 6.1 meter detector distance, we're going to be stuck with a pattern that looks like this. Uh, and we need a pattern that looks like this. And of course, shrinking the pixel size is one way to do that. Uh, but there are sort of physical limits on pixels that don't let you just go arbitrarily small. Um, this problem does have quite a bit in common with uh, one that comes up in, in biological imaging. So in biological imaging, people wanted to make images of uh, biological materials that, that are in, um, at a resolution that's smaller than the, than the wavelength of the, um, of the optical, optical wavelengths. And so they did figure this problem out. They had a super resolution idea that, that named Palm Storm that en ended up winning the 2014 Nobel Prize, where these super resolved images were, able, were, were generated when the, uh, when the diffraction limited images looked like this. Um, so we ended up working with um, folks from Institute Fresnel and, uh, and who, who developed Palm Storm um, algorithms and adapting them to the x-ray problem. And so that's, that's this, the topic I'll be covering here. So let's talk about how Palm Storm works. Uh, the, the way it goes is that, you know, in order to beat, we have, um, we have a diffraction limited image here that, that is blurry and the features are, are gone. Uh, or the, the features of interest we, we can't resolve. But what if we could manifest this image with many, many individual frames, each of which are nearly dark? And so what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, a single frame of this image can be, can be recorded in which only one contributing photon to that image is recorded. This creates a single photon in the detector that's isolated, and it has a point spread function that's very broad but it can be fitted. Its, its location in the detector can be estimated statistically. And, uh, and then these photons can be positioned at sub-pixel length scales. So the idea would be something like this. If we played the movie, we see that if you, if you can create dark manifestations of this image and record them, you can fit all of these photons and position them in the, in the field of view. Uh, at a at a resolution that's much higher than the, than what would be the diffraction limited image, or the point spread function limited image. So as these photons pile up, what we're noticing is that the thing on the left is actually a clock, and it would have been pretty hard to to figure that out uh, without this without this particular super resolution trick. So what we've been attempting to do is utilize this uh, kind of idea for high energy coherent diffraction imaging. Oops, all right, I'm gonna get to the next one here. Okay, so how can it be applied to uh, high energy BCDI? These, this concept of nearly dark X-ray frames or very sparse photon frames can be created if we have uh, CCDs, char um, charge integrating detectors that have fast frame rates. So we gave it a try. Again, we're back to sector one. We're back to 52 keV X-rays and that same uh, gold polycrystal, a different grain this time. Uh, but we brought in a fast CCD detector, which can run. You know, it's not certainly not the world's fastest. Uh, it can run at 100 hertz, uh, but that was good enough to try the concept. Um, the other sort of parameters of the experiment, we've got the same lambda, 52 keV uh, X-rays. We've got a uh, slightly bigger nanocrystal, about half a micron. Now the features of the detector are that the native pixel pitch is 30 microns, so that's already pretty small. Um, we positioned it at 1.1 meters from the sample, which represents sort of a typical BCDI detector distance. Um, so we line up on our grain, we take a 2000 second integrated exposure, and we get a Bragg peak with sort of a fringe pattern that, that just barely is resolved, or you know, one can say is not actually resolved. Uh, putting all these values into the inequality, we see that we just just missed the the sampling limit. So we're we're pretty close, but we we didn't quite make it. And that sort of motivates this idea that we can hopefully get the fast frame rates to pile up in a way that that Palm Storm can be used. So let's take a look at a bit of the data. Uh, we ran, we put that Bragg peak on the detector. We ran at 20, second millise uh, 20 millisecond exposures 
we collected 100,000 of these. And it looks like this. So as you can see, that's quite reminiscent of the of the movie of you know that that small demonstration of Palm Storm creating a picture of the clock. So the hope here is that each of these little specks can be fitted um, with Palm Storm methods. And oops. And so the way we went about doing that is uh, again a collaboration with Institute Fresnel here. Uh, they've got um, it, you know, they've basically established this unlock method which is unsupervised particle localization which was designed for this fluorescence bi biological imaging with palm storm it's it's made up of two steps uh, photon event detection and then sub pixel photon registration both of those steps are sort of very rigorously developed statistical statistical methods uh, that are also quite efficient and so one can can run the software at at something like a thousand hertz uh, and so that potentially can keep up with with actual data acquisition. Certainly in our case, it, it, we, we did this all post-processed because, you know, this is kind of a exploratory experiment, but, it, you know, in the long run, maybe one can hope to, to keep up. Uh, with a bit of work, uh, we, we ended up adapting the unlock method for x-rays. So that's our XR unlock um, idea. Really, the, the two key challenges for doing that adaptation were to deal with uh, the fact that the PSF, the point spread function in this, in an X-ray, charge integrating X-ray camera is much smaller because it's defined by the space, uh, by the charge sharing uh, across pixels rather than the, the, um, the optics limited uh, point spread function in, a, in an optical system. Um, and so, so the hope here again is that this is this is a, a snapshot where three photons hit from our Bragg peak hit the detector and were recorded. And what we want is to use these little, you know, isolate these individual events, and that's what the detection process would do. And then uh, do a do a fitting of a 2D Gaussian uh, point spread function model so that we can localize the event and basically create a small crosshair in the middle of the three of these to, to tell us where that photon hit with you know statistically robust methods and, and high uh, uh high confidence um so so let's see how it worked we summed like i showed you before this was the sum of all the images and we have sort of a blurry diffraction pattern uh we ran for 100,000 frames we ran the uh, xr unlock method and then we got a list of where all the photons were that interacted with the detector. Now we can take that list and grid. Yeah, it was pretty that. cool. I was. Okay, sorry. I, someone chimed in there. I didn't know if that was a question. I don't think so. Um, you can go ahead, Stefan. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, so we took the list of. Um, list of photons and then we can map them onto finer grids than the than the pixelation of the detector so you'll remember it was a 30 by 30 micron pixel detector so what does this diffraction pattern look like at 15 by 15 emulated pixels so we see that the fringes are starting to pop out um we could keep going we could go by a factor of two by a factor of four uh by a factor of eight and by a factor of 16. and now we're down to the sort of almost two micron pixel grid and we still have a recognizable pattern. At this point, it's getting a little bit hard to evaluate it just because we are spreading out our photons over such a huge number of pixels. But this is certainly providing um, an opportunity to, to lower the p debt in that inequality such that we can, um, we can access bigger crystals. I think we actually pushed this all the way up to the 32x uh, subsampling level which is the equivalent of now a sub-micron pixel. So at 940 nanometers, we've sort of emulated photon counting. And here's, the, here's what the picture looks like. It, I think in the context, especially of, of, um, of these fourth generation synchrotrons where the coherence lengths are actually going to be quite long, um, we, this opens the door to imaging quite large grains at reasonable detector distances. Of course, there's lots of challenges. You know, this detector may not be fast enough. There's many other options. 
Um, and I know that there is, there's been some evolution of this kind of idea actually on chip in the hardware of, of some of these detectors, but it's sort of a, it's a very intriguing area uh, of future growth, I think, for, for BCDI. Um, so I think with that, I'll actually be concluding uh, just to give you the overall message again. <clears throat> our group has been aiming to design approaches to broaden the scope of coherent diffraction uh, to address more and more different kinds of material science questions. We sort of feel that the high energy uh, area is, is one in particular that, that, that's well suited. Um, but you know, the overall power of BCDI is that it can provide insight into lattice heterogeneities and defects and their dynamics at nanoscales by coupling, uh, by a strong coupling of these particular properties with the Bragg structure factor. Um, when we talk about high energies, you know, there's sort of new challenges, but also new opportunities. Some of the steps that I've talked about today hopefully lay the foundations of, of progress in this area. Uh, we were able to demonstrate a streamlined use of BCDI with, uh, with an aspect of HEDM measurement that connects the single grain view that you get with BCDI with more of an ensemble uh, view of the grain population. And I think that's an important link to make because if you sort of think about how BCDI is done normally, we often search for grains that look good in the detector and that seem to be behaving well. But we sort of do that in the absence of a, of a population view. Like, is this grain a, an outlier? Is it you know, bigger than normal? Is it smaller than normal? Is it more strained? Is it less strained? Having a map from HED, sort of the average behavior of thousands of grains gives you that insight. And you can sort of position yourself in that histogram. Which image am I making right now? A characteristic grain or an uncharacteristic grain? I think that's, that's going to be a powerful way to to, to kind of utilize this married uh, technique. Um, and also another aspect of this is that when dealing with some of the challenges, we can, we can facilitate progress in BCDI by taking some of the burden away from the experimental design side of it and into the computation or signal processing side. One idea I talked about was to emulate the small pixels with Palm Storm. Of course, this does make, uh, put some burdens on the detector because it's certainly a non-standard uh, measurement. But there's also other ideas we've published that I, I haven't discussed here. We can emulate small pictures, pixels with detector shifting. Uh, we can also adapt BCDI phase retrieval itself to handle undersampled data uh, to, to try to, to get at this particular problem uh, in different ways. So I think with that, I'll stop. I'll, I guess one other comment here would be that, that a lot of these other, uh, a lot of these these ideas we're, we're discussing would also work in the Bragg tachography context, context, and that's another avenue we're eventually going to explore. Um, so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Stefan, for this very very interesting talk. We have a few questions already. Uh, Ian Robinson uh, was the first, so please, Ian, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Stefan. Um, uh, I'm very happy to see the uh, progress with the uh, with the detector that, that you're making. Um, I wondered, did you talk at all with Frederick Levy about his, uh, he had a, a, a droplet algorithm that they used to use a long time ago. Uh, that went, ran live on, on a detector and just saved the uh, saved the the sort of center of mass positions of each uh, each photon that, that that came in. It sounds like it's the same uh, the same method. Um, yeah, yeah, you did. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I, I talked to so we had the 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 droplet recipe I had on hand was from Mark Sutton, but I think you know yeah, it's the it's same one. Yeah, yeah. Vain. I think I, I should have put a slide together on that. That was the first pass um, because sure. I actually run it on my computer and I knew I knew how to do it. Um, yeah, I, I don't have more slides on this, but it, it, I'll be happy to sort of describe it. Yeah, the other uh, sort of you clearly see an improvement of the fringe visibility going for, the, for, for with the first factor of two. Uh, I wonder, have you have you done line outs to actually measure the visibility of the of the fringes, uh, and because you probably don't win beyond beyond a certain amount of uh, division uh, here, but it, you could you could very easily look at the visibility of the fringes you're getting. Yeah, 
Yeah, we, we haven't done that yet. Um, I'll just make one comment is that when we did the droplets, so center of mass of the sort of of the droplet got us from 30, you know, 30 by 30 to 15 by 15. And it looked basically the same, right? But when we tried to move that um, using the droplet center of masses into the 4, 4x upsampled case, uh, there was this a very pronounced grid. It was very obvious that photons were not being landed in the correct spot. Um, and we, we analyzed that a little bit. We, what we noticed is that you really only get a droplet will tell you, are you north, south of the equator or east, west of the meridian? And that's it, right? Um, there's just, it, the, the center of mass biases you into the correct quadrant of the, of the pixel, and that's it. Um, and that's where we actually, that's what motivated us to look for sort of more exotic methods. This, the fact that the COM isn't really a fitting became a problem for this upsampling. You needed more robust fitting to keep going past uh, a 2x factor. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It certainly was faster. It was, I mean, in terms of, you know, using, not needing to adapt a whole new method was a more straightforward avenue, but it, it, it reached a limit. Uh, so then your second point was, what about the fringe visibility? You know, I think, well, we, we might not quite have enough photons to do a great job of measuring that because you know down here especially we're going to start to run into um into these it, pretty noisy minima i think but uh, certainly it's it's something we're going to try yep thank you thank you there was a first a question from pillman do you have a feeling how far you can push the sub pixel resolution in terms of electronic without noise in the, in the detector so what is the limit ah yes so yeah we also made an estimation of that you know we'll i'll point out here you kind of get a sense uh of the signal to noise ratio of the photon event you know here i think the the photon deposits uh 900 they're around a thousand adu integrated and the detector readout noise is about 580 so that's giving you a very very good signal to noise um and the trade-off we we have a, a I don't have a slide of it, but we have a phase diagram essentially. You know, on the x-axis is point spread function size, and the other axis is signal to noise ratio. If you can imagine that, that's really the space in which you're trading off the ability to register these photons. If the signal to noise ratio, uh, if the photon deposited far fewer ADUs, but spread them out more, you still, you can retain the ability to, to position this, this photon. You know, the worst case would be that if the photon was still highly localized, didn't spread much charge, and didn't deposit much energy relative to the, to the thermal fluctuations. So we, we, have, we have basically mapped that out with a sort of a simulation, and it's got sort of theoretical boundaries um, where, you know, when the paper is published, we'll, we'll be able to answer that question, but we're, we're, we're developing that idea. Basically, the trade-off you have to keep in mind is signal-to-noise ratio versus point spread function size. Uh, ben, uh, Dimitri, uh, raise his hands, please, Dimitri. Yeah. Hi, uh, Stefan. Thanks for a great talk. It's really nice development. I think I have a just short question. Uh, you didn't show any reconstruction uh, of the simulation or the real data. Any comments on that? You're talking about the... Um... The real space, the real space reconstruction, yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, the comment is that we don't have the, the rocking curve, right? Uh, we just stayed at one mm. Q and just measured this diffraction pattern. Okay, I see. Mm. I but in simulation, can you simulate the whole thing? Yeah, sure, we can, yeah. Okay. Uh, that we haven't done, uh, but okay. it's a worthwhile thing. I think I, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Like these this whole process and create a rocking curve we could see if there are you know some systematic artifacts that exactly might yeah mm -hmm. uh, suggestion yeah thanks uh, next question was from Ivan thanks. Ivan Botanians please hello Stefan it was a really great talk that you made thank you very much right, um, yes and uh, well I have two two questions now first of all what limited you to, to make 
uh, really um, um, 3D, this in 3D, this image, or to, to rock your crystal and to measure all uh, angles? That would be my first question. Yeah, oh, it was really just time. Um, we had, I mean, we knew that we eventually wanted to rock the crystal, but we had quite a few other things to try, essentially, like the detector itself. We, we took it at different, um, different electronic amplifier settings. What we were trying to do is manipulate the PSF uh, to try to broaden it or, you know, see, see what we could systematically do here in terms of the, the point spread function. So really, it was just time because this photon flux that we have, the coherent photon flux that we have at 52 keV at this beamline is extremely small. So you'll notice that even really this one slice took, what did I say, 2,000 seconds of, of time. And then there's of, of integrated time. And then there's sort of the readout overhead associated with it. So it's just sort of, you know, this was our first try at it, and we didn't, we wanted to try a lot of things, and um, okay. Okay. Clear, we didn't yeah. make it a rocking angle. <laughs> clear. clear, yeah, clear. And another question is, so as soon as you go to these high energies, like 52 kV, uh, you have to take into account quantum efficiency of the detector. Typically, mm -hmm. it's very low in this case, and uh, unless you use special detectors, but, but then pixel sizes um, might much larger. So do, uh, do you know what was uh, the quantum efficiency in this case and in the previous case when you have larger pixel size of 55 um, micron? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to quote you the quantum efficiency, but I do know that this chip, uh, the, the sensor made, um, was made out of silicon here. Oh, that's bad. Silicon is bad for the synergies. It, it, it is what it was. Yeah, you know, it was whatever it was, and you know that that contributed to the the very long count times here. Um, but then in the other example, when we put the detector just very far away from the sample, we were using a a uh, gallium, uh, gallium arsenide sensor, and so that helps you a little bit with the higher energies in terms of quantum quantum efficiency. Okay. Because th this is also an issue actually in such measurements with high energies, and you have to. Yeah have high quantum efficiency, otherwise you lose too much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Next was a uh, question is from Sebastian. Please unmute yourself, Sebastian. Yeah. Um, have you considered the, the use of uh, hyperpixel detectors uh, with the uh, kind of an adapted electronics so that you can actually use the charge sharing between the pixels to locate the actual incidence point of the photon more precisely? Yeah, so so you're talking about detectors that do that in in hardware. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We haven't. I mean, certainly that would be a fascinating thing to try. We haven't got our hands on such a detector, but I think you know I'll I'll be happy to try it uh, because yeah. In some sense, I I would wonder then what the limit comes in terms of the registration accuracy. You know, it, it depends a little bit about what the hardware is doing, how it evaluates that uh, position. You know, centers, centers of mass, I think, as we'll, again, I, I apologize, I don't have these slides. To, the center of mass only got us to a factor of two in terms of upsampling accuracy. So I wonder what the, the, the kind of the calculation, calculus is inside of the on-chip uh, processor there. Maybe, well, maybe. It, it, the, uh, it, the idea would be to, to really measure uh, the charge sharing between four pixels. Hmm. And from this, you can... Yeah, the, uh, there is a detector under development at PSI called MUNC that, that does exactly that. It's a 25 micron pixel, and it can do an effective pixel of about one micron. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, next question was from Gudrun. And uh, you were talking about um, strain sensitivity in the picometer range. And she asks, what does this mean in terms of stability for the beam line? Mm. Yeah, um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah, you're actually decoupled from that pretty robustly. 
right? Because let's go all the way back. All right, so here, what, what one needs to make sure of is that these slices of your reciprocal space pattern are measured accurately, right? And so there, there's, in this kind of experiment, one does have, that, that's, a, that's sort of a critical parameter. Um, but once you measured this in, you know, sort of with thousandths of a degree in accuracy um, and 0.01 degree steps or so, then that, in, as long as you've got that whole um, Bragg peak measured accurately, then the degree of um, sensitivity you have to the picometer scale, that all comes about because of the inversion process and because of the fact that you're coupled to a Bragg peak that, that, that encodes that picometer scale displacement field in, in this speckle pattern. So now you don't necessarily need picometer resolution in terms of the motor stability. You, you, you really are using the fringe pattern itself to encode that picometer displacement field, and then you use inversion processes to get it out again. Um, so for instance, if you, had a, if, you, if you had a very small crystal in a relatively large uh, coherent beam, you could actually tolerate a little bit of, of um, movement of this crystal within your beam. I mean, that's not great, but if you're within a uniform part of your coherent beam, that actually won't impact your measurement. So, so on some level, you can kind of get, you know, you, you, if you're still matching up your crystal with your beam, even in the presence of a bit of, of, of drift of even, you know, hundreds of nanometers, then you can still encode all of that picometer scale information in your Bragg peak. I hope that answers your question. Um, Virginie Shamar was next. Virginie, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Stefan. I think it's the, the first time I'm seeing these results. Uh, that's, that's really cool and that's very promising. I have uh, maybe a naive question regarding uh, the statistics on the final diffraction pattern. I guess you do not preserve the Poisson statistic, right, when you are uh, dividing your, your, your pixels. And um, did, did you try to, I, I mean, is it, is it true or am I wrong here? Oh, uh, no, you do preserve them. Okay. Um, you, your, your, final, your final image still, uh, still presents a, a Poisson statistic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, yes. If you did it pixel-wise, you, you would still get it. I, again, don't have that ready, but uh, that's something I, we, have, we have tried. Okay, but yeah. with, uh, with some prefactor, I guess, right? Because you do not have... Uh... Oh, yes. No, okay. have... yes, 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 I see, I see, I see now. Okay, cool. Right, the prefactor actually, in the summed images, you've got what would be a deviation from the Poissonian statistics because you've got, in yes, some yes. sense, you've not accounted for the dark noise. Yeah, okay. Here, what we have is we've, we've already changed units, right? This is ADU. Yes, 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 I see. And here I see. we've got photon yeah. counts. Right? Okay, cool, nice, thank you. Um, any other questions from, from the audience? You can raise your hand, you can unmute yourself. I, Stefan, are you still um, available? Uh, there is yeah. a question from yeah. Ash in the chat. There is another question from the chat. Yes, actually, sorry, from Ash Tripathi. Yes. Um, there are any efforts to try out multi layer machine learning? Oh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Thank you, Dimitri, on this noisy measurement. Ah, that's, yeah, that's, we didn't start there, but one can certainly imagine that. Um, you know, we started with where the pomp storm method left off, really, which was that, you know, there's a method in which one does detection and registration, and, you know, we're, we're going in that direction for now. Though, I think a machine learning algorithm would certainly be able to learn from enough events and enough correct answers how, the, how to think of a correlation, uh, or at least to, to, to give you the location 
given of these three photons given this this pattern i think that's a that's definitely a um an area to explore i i, I think the folks around here are are thinking of doing that for sure uh, i i've heard of some efforts at argon to to figure out localization photon localization with machine learning okay other questions I have actually one about uh, accumulation of signal, Stefan. Can you, can you estimate what is the number of frames that you need to get a good enough uh, intensity distribution to, to revert, to, to use, let's say? Yeah. Um, okay. From the original so image, I suppose, from the original diffraction signal. Uh, let's see. So, you, in the context of a 3D breath pattern, you know, you sort of have another uh, another axis to the cross, uh, which is theta. So, let's see. Um, one one would need enough statistics in all three dimensions. So, if if this is the statistics we get at one 2D slice, it's going to matter how far in theta we go. And how you know if, if this is the the state of every theta, having many more of them in fine increments is going to sort of boost your overall uh, signal accumulation, right? So I'm, I'm I'm not sure that I'm really answering your question, but uh, my message really would be that you would need enough photons over all three dimensions. That's kind of the unit, uh, the relevant unit, I think, in some in some level as long as your sampling criterion is, is fulfilled, uh, to get this amount of photons in, in this particular plane, um, yeah, we basically, you know, for, for 2,000 second exposure, we had almost no overhead in this detector, so there wasn't too much of a, you know, it was almost one to one. We just ran this as fast as we could and, uh, and then saw the photons come in one at a time. I think another comment I'll make is that we had to pick, in terms of matching an overall signal rate to account a, a readout frame rate, there was a stipulation, right? To do, uh, when would this break? It would start to break when too many photons hit the detector in, two, in 20 milliseconds, and then PSFs would overlap. And then the fitting is not three individual events. It's now a fitting problem where you have to figure out one big connected blob has to account for two or three photons. So that's something that maybe, maybe that's more on the spirit of your question is you know, how much signal is too much signal when you're trying to make sparse, when you're explicitly trying to make sparse images. Um, so that's another aspect here. We, there are, in terms of unlock, there's a mode of unlock that does also fit these sort of two photon events. And it just happens to be a little more complicated and, and a little slower. So our first try was to make sure that we had extremely sparse shots. And that, that does sort of, you know, dictate the trade-off between total signal strength and the maximum speed of your detector. Does that, does that get at your question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so are there more questions or any? I, didn't... I, I could ask. So, so you, you basically need pixels that are small enough that the electron cloud spreads across multiple pixels. Where, where does the, where do you start? Cause you know, you could have put this pixel or this detector uh, uh, half the distance uh, closer to the sample and oversampled pretty well, right? So, so where do things start to, to fall apart, right? Do, do you at some point need pixels that are so small to get charge sharing that you could have just put the detector a little bit closer to the sample, you know? Is there a, is there a place where, where things don't work anymore? <laughs> Well, the charge sharing has no relationship to the sample to detector distance, right? Yeah, yeah, but but it, it's, but you need pixels that are small enough to get charge sharing. So at some point, you could just move that pixel a little bit further away and oversample the diffraction pattern and be done with it. 
so so where do you you know do you actually win yeah i think you do I, well one one thing i'd say is that this particular detector had you know 400 knobs to turn in terms of the actual mm -hmm. electronics and so that's another place to that we spent a bit of time playing I, a little bit unsuccessfully but you know i think in theory one can mess around with the um with the amp you know the amplifiers and the bias of the uh, across the sensor all that kind of stuff to manipulate the degree to which charge sharing is encouraged or discouraged right uh, when we started to actually play around with that kind of parameter it started to throw off other stuff and so it wasn't great but i think in principle you could say that you know generally if we have a 52 kev photon and we want it to be spread over eight pixels you know that would be great um there's probably ways to do that with the bias and the amplification in the detector um mm -hmm. yeah and so that's that's one game to play whether you win you know why, why do i think this is worth doing uh if we go back to this picture mm -hmm. All right, so here, here we go. Where you win, I think, is that at some point you won't be able to be close, far enough away, even oh, if you- Yeah, that's true. Yeah, to oversample a grain. Yeah, so when the grains get big, you won't be able to be far enough away. Yeah. And I think, I think that's gonna be kind of key in this kind of problem, right? Uh -huh. There's, in this picture, perhaps if we were at this grain right here, we've got a shot at oversampling it with typical pixel sizes. But, you know, again, it kind of goes back to the question of where the material science is in, where is it, where is the action happening here when deformation is occurring? If it happens to be in the middle of one of these big grains, you, you need a 25 meter hutch to do this, even with the finest pixels. So that's where strategies to really emulate photon counting at almost micron scale pixels is, is a must, even if you've got seven meters, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, I think it's uh, 506. Maybe we can close here with the uh, session. I thank Stefan again. I thank everyone who has participated.